Okay, in terms of stuff, the deadlines are change by, so quiz is part one, deadline February 1st, to just Friday, left to 9 p.m. Exam one, quiz is part two, March 1st, also under day. Uh, exam two, quiz is part three, April 5th, under day. Exam three, exam four, quiz is part four, April 26th. And exam five, um, in the finals week. For the paper, draft deadline April 4th, plus five deadline April 9th, emergency deadline April 16th, and 50% deadline April 26th. And the final versions go in on, or final version goes in on Blackboard, and deadline is end of day. If you're going to upload your final version, be sure it's PDF or Word, so I can read it. Before pressing on to the old new stuff, anything about the old, old stuff, or stuff to be that needs more stuff. Is there a time that you have to do the quiz, or is there a time? Um, no, the, the exams, uh, exams and quizzes, you can do them any time you want, any time during the day, as long as you get them done by the deadline. So they're always, always available up until the deadline. Anything else? Okay, so last time we're looking at our good dead friend Plato and Socrates talking about the famous line. And we saw that he divides up epistemology, metaphysics, into these zones. So at the lowest level, the A level, are images which are developed by imagination. And this would be things like shadows, hallucinations, and perhaps most importantly, art. It is the least of things. Not zero, but marginally better than zero. Then level B would be the physical phenomena, which is the realm of belief and true opinion. This would be you know, physical objects, and would include sciences like biology, astronomy, chemistry, etc. And one implication I noted before is that given Plato's view, you cannot have knowledge of any of these sciences. At best, you can have true opinion. This is a very strict account of knowledge. Level C would be the realm of the mathematicals and lower forms, and that is two hallmarks. As we saw, one is you do it with symbols, you know, mathematical symbols, you know, ge geometric symbols, logical symbols, and you do it through a series of steps. So geometry, logic, mathematics live there, and you can be you can know that stuff according to Plato. Then the highest level for him would be the realm of the higher forms, you know, justice, beauty, and the good. And you don't do these with symbols. I mean, you, you can write out like form, or you can draw like this is a symbol of justice. But we don't use actual symbols and steps to do it. We see it by the light of the good. And as I mentioned before, this becomes something that infests the rest of philosophy uh, up until this day, which is the idea that you have a, a faculty of this light of natural reason, which is used by many thinkers. Some like Aquinas, you know, time and God. Others just make it like the light of natural reason. But it becomes a big question as to like, what is that? And how do you tell when you're seeing stuff by the light of natural reason or when you're just psychotic? Okay, so now on to the new old stuff. Now Plato lays out his famous allegory of the cave. And the scenario he imagines, which has become like, famous and stuff, if you've seen the movie The Matrix, you've seen it done with a pretty good budget and with good actors, and also two reads, uh, although maybe he's good, better than me, because he gets acting jobs. <laughs> someday Hollywood, someday. someday. <laughs> now, what Plato asks us to imagine is a scenario in many ways kind of like this room. So imagine, if you will, this room. And in Plato's original version, of course, he uses fire, but all up there to the LCD projector. So initially, everyone is in the room. And as far as people believe, what they see projected on the wall here is real. Because it, you know, to make the idea of analogy, the projector would be back and you'd be able to see it. Because in Plato's original version, people are trapped in the cave, and there's like a, a wall behind them and then behind the wall is a walking area with a fire, and people walk carrying sticks with objects on them, and the light of the fire projects it onto the wall. Now the reason why Plato does that is because during his time, 
Uh, that was pretty much all the technology they had. You know, they had fire and sticks. Today, of course, we could use it with virtual reality. So if Plato was Plato in today, he'd probably use the allegory of VR. But it's a similar idea. So initially, people are trapped, trapped in the cave, chained to their chairs, behind them the fire, and people walking, projecting the shadows upon the wall. And they believe that these shadows are real, because they have no reason to think otherwise. Then he asks us to imagine someone who slips free of their bonds and of their noose in the cave. And they get up from their chair and they're looking around and they see, you know, all the people that are chained in place. And they see the wall and they hop up on top of the wall and see the people walking there in the fire and they're loose in the cave. Then the next step, they realize that behind the fire is a way out. So they, you know, clamber up the stairway up into the external world. And there, initially, of course, when they go into the light of the sun, they're blinded because in the cave, all the only light there is is the fire. So their eyes are not adjusted to it. Just like in the scene, if you've seen The Matrix, when they pull Neo out of the sewer, and surprisingly clean for being in the sewer, and he says, why do my eyes hurt? And of course, uh, Morpheus says, you, because you've never used them. But in Plato's, they've been used, but you've never seen the sun. And so at first, the person has to rely only on the light of the moon or kind of shade their eyes. But eventually, they adjust to the light of the sun. So what is this allegory allegorizing? Well, not surprisingly, it corresponds to the line. So diagrammatically, which I think that might be a word. <laughs> but at this point in our civilization, who cares if it is or not? So initially in the cave, you have the following scenario. People are in chains, trapped in the cave. And this is the world of illusion, corresponding to the A part of the law. Then the next step is that people are free, or a person is free and loose in the cave. And this corresponds to level B. This is sense perception, and the fire is analogous to the, to the sun. So this level of the cave would be like, well, this, you know, the experience of the physical world. Then when the person escapes outside of the cave, that's the level of, you know, the next level up, so you've got A, B, and C. And this level, you've got the mathematicals, you know, et cetera. And analogically, a person can't look directly at the sun, but they can look at shadows and reflections. And then finally, level A is being fully liberated, totally free from the cave, and being able to see everything illuminated by the light, the light of the good. And so that's his famous allegory of the cave. And if you've seen the movie The Matrix, that's basically the allegory of the cave combined with Descartes' meditations with guns and explosions. So if you're wondering what philosophy would be like with guns and explosions, uh, The Matrix, pretty good place to begin. So that's his famous allegory. Now, he then asks us to imagine what would occur if someone return back to the cave. Now his, his allegory also, in addition to like being an allegory for his line, also serves as kind of a metaphor of you know, education and life. Like we are perhaps intentionally literally trapped in chairs throughout our education, staring at the wall, staring at the, at the blackboard or the whiteboard or the screen. And we're told, you know, lies and shadows to deceive us. And then of course eventually we start like learning about the world, but we're still trapped. We're still trapped within this deception. And then some people break free to see you know, the light of death. And of course, we get our metaphors for enlightenment and so forth from here. Now, Socrates then foreshadows what is to come. And of course, he can do this because Plato is writing the dialogue after the fact. So he knows what will happen. Now, a critical part of Plato's view is the good. And as mentioned before, the good is all kinds of good stuff. It is the author of all things, the Lord of light, um, etc. And so it presumably is the cause of all, all the forms, perhaps, and it illuminates them. And so we get from this this idea of being enlightened. If you ever wondered, like, 
why is good associated with like light, enlightenment, uh, probably goes back to our good dead friend, Plato, it's his metaphor. Now one way to look at this, as I mentioned before, is if you're not sure like how this all kind of works, think of it in terms of, if you're familiar with you know, Christianity, uh, think of it kind of putting God in the place of the good, and it kind of works the same, same way. Although for Plato, God's not a, I mean, good, the good's not a person. So what happens if someone has seen the good and they go back into the cave? Well, probably initially, if you have like a dark cave, it's all spooky and scary, you probably wouldn't want to go back in. But Socrates decides to go back into the dungeon. So, not metaphorically, if a person is out in bright sunlight, like the sunlight in Florida, last but not today, and they go into like a dark place, like a cave or a bar or something that's dark, can they see well? No, they're blinded by the dark. Now, Socrates says, and again foreshadowing, says that if someone goes back from seeing true justice to the shadows of justice here, they will behave ridiculously. So when they're in the, the court, they will seem foolish because instead of engaging with the shadows of justice, they've seen the reality. And they'll be bewildered by all these shadows and confusions. Or so he comes. Now again, of course, he's foreshadowing in advance the, what happens to him in the apology. Now, he also notes that, again, he likes the analogy of the, of the eye, and he claims that, as we saw before, that knowledge is something that's already going to be in the soul. And the soul has this power and capacity to learn, and he notes that the, the soul is like the eye, having to turn towards it. And so he likes that metaphor once again. Yes. You said knowledge cannot be lived. Oh, his claim is is that because one of the the battles of epistemology is like is knowledge like preloaded from the factory, so to speak, or does it get put in there? And his claim is the soul you don't get knowledge put into it in a way it's already going to be there. Now there's some debate about because of this next part about exactly how that that works because as his metaphor says. Um, in order to see, the eyes must not be, be blind, so it's already their capacity to see. And so the question is, does he mean that there's already knowledge in the soul already, and you never you already know everything and nothing more can be put in there? Or does he mean that the soul already has this power and capacity to learn that's built in, and then you can, as we'll see in the email, that when you're hanging out the forms, you can learn from it. And those are two different things, because one is you're like pre stock with everything and you don't learn anything because you already have it all. The other interpretation would be that you, your soul can learn, you have all these capacities and functions built in, but your soul is not already, not already filled up. So like when you're hanging in the forms, you get them. And so one of the sort of recurring debates in philosophy, one is, what's in the mind or soul, you know, at the beginning, something or nothing, then there's a question about what are these capacities. As we'll see we talk about our good dead friend Leibniz, he argues that you have knowledge in there, but you don't quite know it, but it's mostly capacities and powers already in there. And he uses a metaphor of, it's like uh, veins and marble. Who knew that? Just like wood has, you know, grains and veins, so does so does marble. And I looked it up just to be sure, and it's like, yeah, it's true. It works all like wood. Yeah. So the question is, if you think there's stuff in there, how much stuff do you have? Do you have like all the stuff back in there, or is it like this capacity to get the stuff? And Plato seems to kind of say both things. He says, you know, you can't put knowledge of the soul that wasn't there before, uh, so it's got to be in there. But he also says, well, it's a capacity to 
lowered. And then as we'll see when you look at the Mino, he says you're hanging out with the forms when you're dead, and then that's when you're learning about, about them. So in a way, you learn about this stuff, but not through the senses, and you have it when you're born, but you learn when you're dead. So it gets weirdly complicated. Does that help at all? Or does that just make it worse? <laughs> oh, um, maybe a drawing would help. <laughs> it never does. But. So what he seems to be saying is like, OK, this is the soul. The first, thing, the first line seems to be saying, you can't put stuff in there that's not already there. So taken strictly, it would seem to say, uh, it's already going to be in there, and then you're putting it in there. It's sort of, I mean, one way to use a, a modern metaphor would be like, you can't put an app in your phone unless the app's already there to like update. Maybe. So one thing is, is that it's got to be there before you can put it in there, which would seem kind of a weird thing to say. If it's already there, you can't put it in there. But then he also says that one way to think is maybe he doesn't mean like it's already all in there, but the soul has the power and capacity to get that. Go with the phone metaphor, so your phone may not have the app, but it's in the app store, and your phone could down could download. It could get it. If it didn't have that capacity to download apps, then it couldn't get the the app. Maybe that's what he what he means. Now what could be going on here also is something that later appears in Aristotle. You'll see as we get to Aristotle about, um, as he says here, going from becoming to being. So another way you can kind of interpret it is that the soul, let's take the example of justice. So the soul doesn't initially have justice, the knowledge of justice, but it has potential, the potential to know justice. And so the idea being that it can know justice, but doesn't. I was going to say, so in, in a sense, he's basically saying, like, just because it's dark in a room doesn't mean it's not there. It's just the light is showing that it's there. And you seeing it is what the light really is. Yeah, yeah, good metaphor. Yeah, so like, yeah, this darkness here, then when the light shines, you can see it and you have the capacity to see it. There's like a space in your soul for justice, and then it's ready to get that justice, and the justice is put in there. So then you know justice. So you've got, to, according to Plato, you have the capacity to learn about all these forms. Um, so they're not actually, knowledge of them is not actually in there right away but the ability to know them is in there, and you've got to, as you said, it's going to be eliminated so then you see it, and then you go from being able to know justice to actually knowing justice. Which creates a lot of confusing, because in a way, it's kind of not in there, but it kind of is, in a way. I mean, another way to think of it is, um, moving away from what Plato said, but in a way, think of like, um, I'll use a sci-fi story. There's a sci-fi story called um, The Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce. And it's about a creature whose color we can't see. So it's effectively invisible to us. So in a way, it, doesn't, it just doesn't show up on our, our optic nerve. Have you ever seen the movie like Predator, where it's like kind of visible? Kind of like that, except it's just that it's a color we can't, we can't see. Uh, and it's effectively invisible to us. Now, that sounds kind of sci-fi, but there are plenty of colors we can't see. Like, um, like on a flower, there's infrared, like ultraviolet, you know, things that bees can see that we can't. So there's like no place in our brain for that that color. It just doesn't show up. So we can never see that color. But in our mind, in a way, is everything we could ever experience is already in a way in there because we can see it or hear it or touch it. So what Plato could be seen as saying is our ability to like see that is already in there. Then we have to. Then we actually go and see it, and then it becomes like actualized. So using that metaphor in a way, I played it with like this because I'm using the senses, but in a way, if you never saw the color teal, but you could see it, it's seeable. So you, you would have you would have like teal in your brain already, so to speak, but you wouldn't be aware of it until you saw teal. Then you'd be like, oh, teal. It's kind of a green color thing. I am terrible. Which is weird because I used to paint uh, 
I don't mean like artistically, I mean just to paint houses. And they, they would just buy the paint without making their judgments about, about the paint. <laughs> no judgments. Just, you know, just put it on the wall. They pay me, pay with the paint, it goes on the wall. Simple as that. And so that's what he seems to be to be said. Possible. Okay, does that help? <laughs> My goal was to just to have less confusion at the end than the start, or maybe more, maybe more. <clears throat> now Plato also ties this into um, ethics, because we saw with our good day friend Socrates, his idea that to know the good is to do the good, and he had to claim that the cause of evil is ignorance, not knowing. Now, in the case of virtues, he says some of them would be innate, perhaps, but if they're not innate, then they could be added later by habit and exercise. If you take the class in ethics, you'll see Plato's student Aristotle's view about how you how we become good people. It's basically by practice. Now he does think that within the soul there is always a divine element to use a, like a modern metaphor, it's kind of like how the idea, like in, in many religions, that no matter how evil a person is, they still have like a divine soul. That the most wicked person still has some of God's, you know, goodness in them because he created them. And Plato seems to have like a similar view, that the soul always contains some divine element in there. Now, this, of course, can be distorted because if it um, if you like develop it properly, you know, then you become good. But he thinks if you don't fully develop your virtues, then a person can become very bad. Now, this later becomes a, a component of ethics throughout the centuries. Well, if you take the class in ethics, you'll see this especially in our good dead friend Immanuel Kant. We'll see him later, but not his ethics. And so Plato claims this. The most dangerous evil is, in a way, partial evil. And he gives the example of someone who has got a, you know, they still have that divine element, but their soul is, you know, paltry, not fully developed. But they see very clearly. In other words, they have some of the virtues. And that makes them, you know, very dangerous. And so his claim here is one that gets picked up later by thinkers like Kant, is that in a way, evil is ignorance. Super dangerous evil is like ignorance, a lack of these virtues, but possessing, you know, some of them. So for him, kind of the worst danger is being having enough virtue to be really capable, but not enough to be actually good. And that is the most dangerous of all. And we can think of this, um, well, think of the, like in fiction, movies, etc. who are the most dangerous villains? Well, you can think of the ones like kind of in the cartoons, like, um, like in the Smurfs, like Gargamel. Or have you ever seen Scooby-Doo, like the Scooby-Doo villains? Are they dangerous people? The Scooby-Doo villains, classic Scooby-Doo. No, they're just kind of, they're always trying to do some plot, but they're kind of, they don't really hurt anybody, and they're kind of goofy and stupid. Yeah, so they're not really big threats. But in like, you know, serious movies, with serious villains, what are the most dangerous villains like? Killers. Yeah, they're killers, and are they really good at it? Yeah, yeah I mean, for example, um, <clears throat> the Marvel uh, ones on Netflix, like Punisher, etc., they have some pretty, like this one, uh, I think it's Pilgrim is a villain, uh, or the um, uh, Billy Russo character, you know, the Punisher ne nemesis. They have all these really good qualities. Like Billy Russo is like a charming, you know, very skilled, intelligent killer, but of course he's like pretty, pretty evil, spoiler, sorry. And similarly, like the classic movie villains like Darth Vader, he's very capable, but evil. So he seems to be right that. Partial knowledge is more dangerous than like no knowledge at all. So someone who's incapable of anything would be incapable of doing anything, but having sort of like a degree of knowledge 
is super dangerous. So he ties in this epistemology with, with ethics. And later in the future, our good dead friend Emmanuel Kant uh, takes this idea as well, saying that it's your intent that matters. A person could have all these great virtues, but if their will is evil, they will be super dangerous because they've got all the, the skills and abilities and stuff, but they are using them for bad. Now, we looked a bit at the meter before, but again, the, the kind of the question is, so how does that um, process work? How do you learn about the forms when they're not here? Now, some could say that Plato, in a way, is kind of cheating on innate ideas. How so? Well, well, the standard for innate ideas basically is, or the debate is, if you recall back in ancient days a while ago, kind of the question is, like, when you're born, what's in the soul? If you think there's nothing, or, or mind, just like tabula rasa, like Locke said, you'd be an empiricist. You'd say, you know, day one, you your hard drive is empty. If you believe in eight ideas, you believe on day one or day zero, there's stuff in there. Now, it might be stuff that you're not immediately aware of. Different philosophers say, you know, like, some say you just you look in there and you just don't see it. Others, like Leibniz, say, you know, Plato, say you don't. So the main debate is you got nothing or you got something. Now, with Plato, kind of like the way it works is, we saw in the Mino, is that you get it when you're dead. So on one hand, you might say, in a way, they're kind of not innate because when you're hanging with them, before you're hanging with the forms, you don't have anything in there. You have the capacity to get it in there, but you don't got it. There's like, I mean, to use an analogy, it's like having a having like a, a phone that you can load apps on, but there's no apps in there. But of course, for Plato, when you're born, you've you've got it. So in a way, if you go by what do you got when you're born, then Plato is yeah, that ain't ideas. If you got like, what do you got when you're like coming to existence? In a way, you wouldn't be made ideas, although you never get into the senses. So it ends up being sort of really complicated. So what's going on in the Mino with some more details? Well, Mino talking to Socrates, and Mino puts forth the following challenge. He says, being sexist. If a man knows, then he has no need to inquire, which is true. Because if you're going someplace and you know how to get there, you do not need to stop at the gas station. And if you don't know how to get there, you still must stop at the gas station. Because GPS. At least we thought no GPS. Thank God for GPS. That way you can keep your drive and still get there and not die in the woods. It happens. Some, some, back in the day, a man would rather die in the woods than ask for directions. That's what it means to be a man. I'm not just going to die in the woods. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough in this case. Actually, it's, still, it's always tough. Everybody's going to go to tough. Except for some people. If a man does not know, then he cannot know, for he does not know the very subject about which he is to inquire. To sort of put this metaphorically, if you already know where like your keys are, you don't need to say, where's my keys? But if you have no idea where your keys are, you don't even know what keys are, you'll never be able to find them because you wouldn't recognize them when you saw them. So if you know what keys are and you know where they are, you don't have to ask. If you don't know what keys are and you don't know where they are, you can never find them because even if you were standing on top of them, you would not, not know. Therefore, you can never inquire into what you don't know because you'll never know when you, when you get it. And this, of course, creates a bit of a you know, kind of a paradox because you end up in this you know, terrible situation of being unable to know things. In some ways, it's similar to what's called a, um, a circular regress, but somewhat different. Um, the circular regress is when you like, run in a circle. Everyone's heard the saying, you know, or the thing, if you, in order to get a job, get an experience, but in order to get experience, <laughs> you get a job. 
So you can never have a job or experience because you get the job, get an experience, but you can never get that without a job. But you can never get a job without experience, so you're stuck. You never get it. And Mino is running kind of a similar paradox. You know, if you know, you don't have to require. If you don't know, you can't. You can't know. So you can't ever learn what you don't know. So the learning would be knowledge would be impossible. Either you already get it, or you can never get it. <coughs> So what Socrates has to do is beat the paradox. So I've seen how this works before, you know, with the spoilers, but in a bit more details. Socrates puts forth the notion of reincarnation. And reincarnation is what? What happens if that happens? You die and you come back to life, right? Yeah, you die and you come back um, with a new body. So you come back in your old one that's uh, raised dead or resurrection. Reincarnation, you get a new one. Uh, hopefully, maybe an upgrade in some cases. And some religions, though, you come back as like banana slugs and stuff, which is probably a down, a down. Or you can move up. Like some religions have a karma system where you get reborn based on how good you, you were. So if the person is bad, they work their way down. If they're good, they work their way up. So he puts forth the hypothesis that you get a soul, your soul is immortal, your soul is born again and is never destroyed. Is that true? Do we get do we have soul a soul? Yeah. Maybe. Is the soul immortal? Yeah. Is it born again? <laughs> oh. Yeah, because that one you know in a way that's in a way what he's trying to prove is when he says the soul I think he means like Yeah, true. With, with the laws of thermodynamics, the energy that makes us up goes on forever. It's same with the matter that makes us up. Uh, and one of the questions about personal identity, which we cover in metaphysics, is does the you that you keep on going? So it's true, like the molecules that make up each one of us will be here forever. If the thermodynamics is correct, our molecules are immortal. But of course, what we really care about is not are our molecules immortal, but what? In the, in the future, a thousand years hence, will that still be me? That the molecules that make me up will be part of like, you know, squirrels and backpacks, you know, the stuff that makes me up survives, not only my concern. My concern is that a thousand years from now or a million years from now, I'll still be me. Maybe a different body, but I'd still be me. Yeah, so Plato's claiming that you'll still be you forever, that you not just your part, not just your, your energy, not just your molecules, but you as you will keep on going forever. Which is what many, you know, many religions promise. Now, as you might imagine, uh, long after Plato, people are still debating these questions. Do you have a soul? If you do, is it immortal? And then the question of reincarnation. Are we born again? Now, there are some Faith, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc., that do have uh, this reincarnation as part of the part of the system. Also, are there people who believe they lived before? Jeez. Yeah, typically in California, <laughs> where there are people who believe they have past, you know, past life experiences. So sometimes it'll be like something minor, like someone's really afraid of fire, and they'll say, "Oh, they must have died in the fire," or maybe they just might realize fire can kill them. And there are people who claim to have much more elaborate understanding of, of things. Uh, there was one, one case where a person claimed to be, uh, or was said to be a uh, reborn uh, pilot who was killed in World War II, and as proof they said that he had all this knowledge of World War II aircraft and stuff, and all these things that a, a person of that age would not, not have. Now, of course, it's tough to prove because anything you can look up to check someone's story, they could look up on the internet too and make it part of their, their story. And a person might say, why would someone lie? Well, people lie all, you know, all the time. So maybe this happens. So Plato's right, this is not our first rodeo. We've been rodeoing for, uh, I don't know how long, for 
thousands and thousands of years. So his claim is each of our souls, presumably, I don't know, because he doesn't really go into like, because one question is if you get like souls, do they keep getting recycled? You know, you get like, you get like a batch created, you know, from day one, and they kind of keep getting recycled, like milk bottles, or do new ones keep, keep getting made? You know, people have probably heard the expression like someone says they have a young soul or someone has an old soul. And it's an interesting question. Do believe in the soul? Do you get like a new batch? You know, do we all have like new fresh souls? Or are we like, you know, been around a long time? Plato says we've been around a long time. So we've all been born. We've seen this world and we've seen the afterlife. And so he claims we've, as he says, literally we've seen it all. So we know all this, this stuff. Now, we should remember everything we've learned. And we should have no difficulty um, recalling this. So what Plato concludes is that Mino's got to get it wrong, that we do know stuff. So how is this like? dying and being reborn, how then do we know this stuff? Oh, this is what he thinks. <coughs> and I mentioned this before, so we're spoiled it. But um, Socrates, <coughs> his proof is he, he goes through step by step, talking uh, Mino's slave through this geometric proof. And he asks, you know, Mino, does this person know geometry? And Mino says, no, you know, never was charged geometry. And what Socrates does is says, well, he asks the, the person a series of questions, and they get the proof wrong. So he claims that the knowledge must be innate. Because his reasoning is he didn't learn it while he was alive. So, but the knowledge is there, so it must have come from somewhere else. If he didn't learn it when he was alive, he must have learned it when he was dead. So he's recollecting innate ideas. So he knows them, but in a way he's not aware of them. So they're already built in there. They just have to be reminded, just be reminded of them. So the person didn't initially know because Socrates, you know, pulls the answers by asking the questions. So the person had these notions in their mind. So they have true motion notions, but don't know initially, even though they're right about it. So how does it then get transformed into knowledge? Well, this is what happens according to it's the dialectic. <coughs> questions. And so the person just keep at you. If you frequently ask someone questions, eventually they would know. They would recover their knowledge without being taught. So if the person always possessed the knowledge, they would always know. If they acquired the knowledge, they could not have acquired it in this life unless they'd already been taught geometry. But as Socrates has argued, according to Mino, the person never learned geometry here. So they must have always possessed this knowledge. But he's got the knowledge, despite never being taught. So he leaps to the pretty extreme you know, inference that if you didn't get the knowledge here in this life, it must be at some other time. Which it must be in a time when he wasn't a human, namely when he was dead. And so his view is, is that the soul always possessed the knowledge, but in being reborn, the knowledge is forgotten. Still there, but forgotten. And so the truth of all things is always in the soul. The soul is immortal. All it requires is reminding people of that knowledge. So Mino's claim is, is false, that we all have this knowledge. We just don't know that we know. 
it isn't the product. So to use an analogy, it's sort of like you lost your keys, you don't remember where your keys are, you don't remember what keys are. So you wouldn't be able to find them, except in your mind somewhere, you know what keys are, you know where they are. And all that has to happen is someone has to ask you, where did you put them last? And suddenly you say, oh yes, I remember what keys are, I remember where they are. So you knew all along. It's kind of like in uh, Kung Fu Panda. You know, the seeker was in person all the time. So the knowledge is in there all the time. You just didn't realize it was there. Or so he claims. So for a system to work, all that required is required is this. Person is their soul. The soul is immortal. The soul, when, when your body dies, goes off to the forms, hangs with the forms, has that knowledge, gets reborn, Forgets that it, the soul forgets that it knows, but there's enough in there that with proper questioning, you can remember that you know, because it's already in there, you're not learning anything, you're just being reminded of what you already know, and then that's how you know. So in a way you never learn, you merely remember. Now again, this is for the, the forms, so, and also geometry, etc. So, he wouldn't consider things like, we say things like, we know that Trump is president, or we know that uh, today is Tuesday. But Plato would say, you don't know that Trump is president because you believe it, and it's true. You believe that today is Tuesday, and it's true, but you don't know it because knowledge requires, you know, you, gotta, you can only know the forms. So we get all the knowledge already in us about you know, justice and geometry and so forth, we just forget it, we just have to be reminded. And so essentially, philosophy is going to be kind of like a psychotherapy. You know, remember geometry, remember the forms. So you're taking geometry or philosophy, you're, you already know all this stuff, you just got to recollect it. So it's kind of like when you've taken a, it's like when you've taken a class, it's like think of all the classes you've taken. All this stuff is still in there, you don't start to remember that you remember. And then sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I remember how to do, do that. Or riding a bike. If you haven't ridden a bike in, in years, they say you never never forget. And apparently you don't. And you're like, oh yeah, you don't remember this, you remember, but you get it back. Or so it goes. So is that how it works? <laughs> Does that seem plausible? Or crazy. Or both. I mean, it's no more crazy than <laughs> anything else. It'd be kind of tough to. I'd say. Um... You can kind of see something like that when you think of like math and stuff like that. Like, so I like to use the geometry example because like with algebra and stuff like that, like so long as you like are like kind of like at least told what these signs are supposed to be, and then you're given like the formula, the system that it runs through, it's gonna produce it something. And so I can see how you say like some of this like a a social construct that we play into. So like presidency, like we had to create that entity and then buy into that and then, then Trump becomes president. That's not something that like is absolute knowledge and information. So it's it's very impossible for that to be replicated across time. But like one plus one is equal to two, like you can definitely replicate that across time. As so I can kind of see the possibility. Yeah, that's a good point because you could, as long as you had like language as someone, you could walk them through like a, they, they would get like a geometric proof. But if you're trying to explain like the presidency to someone who has no idea about that, or like a complex social constructs, yeah. you'd have to like give them every single, because they wouldn't just say, like, oh, I suddenly I see all, you have to give them every single single point. Yeah, and there's not, in a way there's nothing in there, you've got to put it all in there, whereas the geometry, you're kind of, they've already got a lot of stuff in there, and you're just kind of reminding them. That's a good, good point. So, some, some plausibility. And the good news is, we all get an answer to this. Because when you die, either it's this or it's, or it's not. So if you're like, and you're like, hey, what are these things? The forms. Hmm, Plato was right. Good thing I took that philosophy class. Hey, Justice, good to see you again. So, at this point, we've got Plato, who kind of lays the foundation of uh, Western epistemology for thousands of years to come. But also during the, before, even before Plato, the foundations of doubting this knowledge was in place. So now we turn to sort of another main part of epistemology. And again, the two main camps are people who say, I can know stuff. And people who say, 
no, you can't. The people who say, no, you can't, they are, of course, the skeptics. Now, skepticism, like coffee and ice cream, comes in a variety of flavors. But unlike ice cream, often not delicious. <clears throat> now, in general, if you're a skeptic, you would say, we don't have knowledge. Now, philosophical skepticism is different from like pragmatic skepticism. Pragmatic skepticism is something that says, you know, I don't believe that, and you, you know, show me, give me, give me proof. The philosophical skeptic says, not, you know, show me and proof to believe it. They say, we don't know. Or more precisely, we can't be completely certain that any of our beliefs are true. Now, a big chunk of the war over skepticism is over the question, as you would imagine, what is knowledge? Namely, how confident do you have to be to say that you know? And sort of ironically, the stronger you make knowledge, you know, the, the more you know, indubitable, the more certain you make knowledge, the easier the skeptic's job is. So, to illustrate, suppose knowledge just required you be, you know it if you're like pretty sure. Well, in that case, we probably know a lot of stuff, because a lot of stuff we're probably pretty sure about. And so the skeptic has a harder time. But if we require that we be absolutely certain about it, with no possibility of doubt, then it's almost impossible to beat the skeptic, because there's always going to be some you know, tiny bit of doubt. So somewhat ironically, the stronger you make knowledge, the more certain you make it, the easier the job is for the skeptic. The weaker you make knowledge, the harder the skeptic's job is. But then, of course, the trade-off is, if you say you know something, if it's probably sure, then knowledge only becomes so watered, watered down. So what are some of the varieties of skepticism? Well, one version is called local, not because they're like locally sourced, but, but because they're you know, narrower in scope. Sometimes we know maybe more, a better term would be moderate skepticism. The moderate skeptic would be kind of in many ways like a modern like, you know, scientist. If you ask them, can you know mathematics, logic, is it yeah? Can you have empirical knowledge about like chemistry, biology, and astronomy? They say sure. If you ask them, can you know about metaphysical stuff like the soul and so on? They say eh, no, that's all just philosophical, you know, mumbo mumbo stuff. So this would be again kind of a typical scientific view today. Because if you talk to like a typical hard scientist, they'd be like, yeah, I can know know all this physics stuff. But if you start talking about the soul, they would probably say, you know, yeah. I can't can't know that stuff. Now the next step up in terms of being you know, more skeptical, let's call it the global skeptic. Not because they doubt the existence of globes, but because it's a broader skepticism. Their doubt is universal. You can't know about the external world, you can't know about other minds, you can't know the metaphysical truths, but there's still one safe place, namely mathematics and logic. So analytical truths, like 2 plus 2 is 4, triangles have three sides, uh, if P then Q, P therefore Q is valid, you can know that stuff. Truths that don't talk about what exists are still truths. And this would be is a pretty extreme view. But there are more extreme views, because there are always more extreme views. Now, the most extreme form of skepticism is, of course, called extreme skepticism, also known as super-global. Now, for the super-global skeptic, if this is a thing, they're doubting it. So they deny all knowledge. Not only like, you know, metaphysical stuff, but even mathematics and logic. So you say to the super-global skeptic, can we know that 2 plus 2 is 4? They'd say, no. Can you know that uh, triangles have three sides. They'd say, mm, probably, probably can. Now, the, the smart skeptics, the careful ones, they don't say we don't know, because that would put them into knowing they don't know. They say we probably don't know, or it seems like we don't know. So, if you ask them, do we really? Do you know that we don't know? They would say, I don't know that. 
which is weird but consistent. So the most extreme skeptic is everything. Whatever you put forth, they would say, I don't know. Now, on one hand, you might think of this as just merely being annoying, like a kid who always asks, why? And in some cases, it can be. But as we'll see, this is a position that's pretty easy to defend, weirdly enough. Sort of ironically or paradoxically, it's super easy to argue for skepticism. It's super hard, perhaps even impossible, to defeat it. Now, People, of course, have tried. And interestingly, people have tried to break skepticism with skepticism. And this is called methodological skepticism. It's when you're a skeptic, not because your end game is skepticism, but because you're using it for some other you know, end. It's a means to an end. Now, one of the best known examples of this is our good dead friend Descartes, we'll look at. Descartes accepts skepticism to defeat skepticism. Because, spoiler alert, what he tries to do is say, I'm going to try to doubt everything until I find the thing that cannot be doubted. And that is going to be what I know. And so he's using skepticism as a tool to break skepticism. Other people use skepticism kind of an interesting way to defend religion. And there's how. We'll see this with our good dead friend, Kant argues, again, spoiler alert, that uh, you can't disprove God's existence. You can't prove God's existence. So there's no way to know whether God exists or not. So what he concludes is not that you should be an atheist. He concludes then this opens the field so that you could believe in God based on faith or morality. So one common tactic was to use skepticism to basically destroy well, argumentation. Because if you can get rid of like all the atheist arguments, then you can make the field safe for God. You can say, well, all these you know, really powerful arguments for atheism, you can't know, so there's room for God. You can't prove them or disprove them, but then you can have faith. And so, interestingly enough, many believers, theists, use skepticism in the defense of, of faith. Because if you can't prove it or disprove it, you got to have, as George Michael said, you got to have faith. I'm not sure that was what that was what he was talking about, but it could be. Now, skepticism goes way, way, way back, and it comes from the original term made into like an English version of it. Uh, skepticos was the view, and it kind of what it literally means is not like doubter, it means sifter. Like, you know, you might sift through sand for, you know, uh, diamonds or, you know, dinosaur bones. And the skeptics, the skepticos, they believed that our beliefs were an error, that we were wrong, that we didn't have a foundation for our. Now, they arrived at this not by saying, you know, they didn't start off saying we're just wrong, but they, they like, in a way, kind of sifted and said, we're wrong. Now, there are, interestingly, some rock star skeptics, which is kind of weird because, by their own view, you should, you should doubt they even exist. One of them, who may, may have been, who knows, was a fellow named Pyro of Ellis, 320 to 270 BC. Back then, um, one thing you might have noticed if you take like history, philosophy stuff, is usually people have like one name and it'd be like of a place, so you could differentiate them, like Pyro of Ellis as opposed to like Pyro of Tallahassee. Uh, and then last names eventually developed into a, a thing. And many of them were like place names, like smushed. So he's like Greece or Yeah, he was in um, the Greek guy, super dead now. If he ever existed. Now, he was a reviver of skepticism because skepticism existed before him, and he came along and you know said, "Hey, let's get the band back together and skepticize again." Now, academics, in many ways, is exactly like fashion. If you live long enough, 
you see the same fashion come into fashion, go out of fashion over and over again. For example, I remember when they were bell-bottom jeans back in the 60s. And they came back, eventually they came back as flare, they were flare for a while. I'm not sure what they're, what they're called now. They were like, I don't know, Facebook jeans or Instagram. What are they called now? Because I know they're back, I see them occasionally. What did you say? Flare. Yeah, flare. So I guess I guess flare stuff. They used to be bell bottom, and they would get ridiculously bell bottom. They'd be like become like just unwalkable. Uh, there was like a thing of like big pants and big shoes back in the '60s and '70s, and things you think would be like not possible, they were possible <laughs> and ridiculous. But it was kind of glorious because you never knew what you'd see people wearing. It was just like it was like wow, that's that's pretty impressive. Super dangerous though, like big huge platform shoes and big bell bottoms. That's just begging for death, but worth, worth it for the impression. So, getting back to the main point, fashion just kind of cycles through. You know, so you'll see, you know, I've been teaching here for a long time, I've seen the fashion side, things go into phase, they go out of phase, they come back, they you know, come back again. And you'll see the same thing happen, happen too. Now, academics is the same way. Things come in, they, everyone's like, oh, this is awesome, let's all do skepticism. Then they go, then they're like, oh, let's do something else. And they come back, and they go out, and they come back. So most things are just bad. So there's no real logical reason. People just do it, they get bored, and it comes, comes back and goes away. Like superhero movies, they're all pop now. People get tired of them, they'll go out of phase for a while, they'll, they'll come back. Rom-coms went out for a while. They're super big, they went out, they still have a few, but they'll come back again. And then rom-com superhero films with dinosaurs. So what was Pyro up to? Well, we don't have any of his writings because like our good dead friend Socrates, he said, you know, it's not for writing. Also, if you're like a skeptic, why bother writing? Because you don't even know if there's paper or other people or anything. I've always thought that the, there's probably the greatest skeptic in the world. You'll never hear of them because they doubt everything. They just be like sitting out in the desert, you know, just dying because they doubt everything. They just like, that was probably the greatest a skeptic was probably like Shiloh or like Ellis or something who just went out in the desert and just died of skepticism. But no one knows because, you know, skepticism. So here's to Shiloh of Ellis, the greatest skeptic who never was. So what did Pyro give us? Well, he laid the foundation of essentially the weapons that still kill, <laughs> you know, knowledge today. Interestingly, in a way, there's really been nothing new under the sun, so to speak, when it comes to skepticism. All the financial arguments were laid thousands of years ago, and they still work really well. To use a metaphor, it's kind of like the knife. I mean, yeah, you get like different versions of the knife, but the knife works pretty well. And we still have the knife, you know, on the table today, you know, thousands upon thousands of years later. Also the wheel. You know, wheels work pretty well. You have some minor improvements, but basically the wheel is the wheel. It's a round thing that goes round and round. So his first argument is this, the sense experience argument. He claims sense experience can't give you any knowledge. And here's why. To know that what you're experiencing through your senses is really real for real, you've got to know that what's going on in here matches what's out there. But can you get out of your own mind? Can you not be you? No, no matter where you go, as Buckley Banzai said, there you are. You can never escape yourself. You can never go home again. You can never escape yourself. And no matter where you go, there you are. So if you can't get outside of your sensations, you never know that what's going on in here matches what's out there. So in a way, we can imagine, just kind of sci-fi, we can imagine like a um, Outer Limits, Twilight Zone, Black Mirror episode. Imagine um, hey, you're watching the episode, someone Someone wakes up and they're in a room. Closed off room, no, no exits. And there's a row of monitors that's around the room. And a, a voice says to, says to them, you must choose which is real and which is false. Now, just being in the room, looking at the monitors, can the person tell what is real? You know, some, the voice says to them, some things you see on the monitor may be real, scenes from outside. Some may be completely fictional, generated by a computer. Well, how do you tell? Well, if you're trapped in a room looking at monitors, how do you know it's real? They never leave. No. 
You never do. You just have to guess. <laughs> I hope the voice you know doesn't try to kill you. Yeah, and then, you know, laying aside the metaphor, that's our scenario. We are trapped in our mind, and the monitors we're looking at are our senses. So we can never get outside of our mind to see that there really is a room that we're, we're in. Now, on one hand, this seems absurd. How can this not be real? But then the challenge is, how would you actually prove it? And Pyro really laid out the problem. You can never get outside of your own mind to see that you're experiencing this for real. Because no matter what you experience, it's still just an experience. Now, over the centuries, people have, to use it metaphor of a knife, they made it sharper and you know, more elaborate, adding in things like virtual reality, the matrix, etc. But the basic idea remains the same. You never know that what you're experiencing is really real for real, because you can never get outside of your own mind. You can never confirm the reality of what you're experiencing. Now, of course, people like in the movies and shows say, like, pinch yourself, but you can dream that you're pinching yourself. And so there's nothing that distinguishes it. Now, the movie Inception did try to solve this problem. Anybody see the movie and see the solution that the dream dudes would, would use? They had a little trick they found to work. Well, the gimmick, top. yeah, the top. Yeah, the gimmick was they'd have like a little little thing, like the, the Leonardo DiCaprio character had a little top thing, and he'd spin it. Because the idea was that it would, it would be like a constant thing, and of course, in the real world, the top would eventually spin down. But in the dream world, the top would keep on spinning, which is why at the end of the movie, you see the top, the movie ends with the top still spinning. Because you don't know whether it's like still the dream and it's spinning, or whether once the camera goes off, that it falls over. So you never know if it's a dream within a dream, within a turkey, within a duck, within a squirrel, within a twinkie, within a backpack. Now the problem with that is, of course, if you spin the top, and it falls over, do you now know that you're in the real world? No, because you could be dreaming that the top falls over. And if the top spins forever, you still don't know if you're in the dream world or not because you don't know, maybe maybe tops, real tops spin forever because it's spin, because you already have to know whether it was real or not real to know how tops really worked. So to know if your top would tell you real from not real, you'd already have to know the real world in order to make that work. And unfortunately, you, you can't. That's, that's the problem. We don't know how tops really work because we don't know if we're in the real world. Good effort, though. Good effort. Now, a second argument is this. This is actually kind of weaker. Now, if the senses can't help us, the other option, of course, that Plato gave was reason. Now, Pyro says reason can't help you. Why not? Well, he claims for every argument you give, there's always an equally good counter-argument. So if you argue there is a world because argument, 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 you can come along and say there is not an external world because argument just is good. So if he's right, there's no rational way to prefer one argument over another. So you can't know that there is a real world, that we know stuff. Now, Pyro doesn't say that he knows we don't know. Because if he said, aha, the argument that we know is just as good as the argument we don't, Pyro would say, yeah. But his victory condition is not establishing that he knows that we don't know. All he has to do to win is show that you can't show that we know. And then his view is he wins. Here's a sports metaphor. It'd be like if, for you to win, you've got to score touchdowns. For your opponent to win, they just have to keep you from scoring. And they, they win. They don't have to score any points, they just, they just win. And of course, that's kind of a tough thing, because if you have a score to win, and they just have to keep you from scoring, and they don't have to score at all, they have a huge advantage. And the skeptic does have that advantage. They don't have to prove that we don't know, they just have to show that you can't prove that we know. So, and the critics would say, hey, that's, that's cheating. And the skeptic would say, prove it. Now, this is probably the weaker one because 
this is probably not true. <laughs> because you can argue for any side, but it does seem clear that there are some sides that are just not equally good. I mean, take the obvious argument like proving that triangles have three sides, trying to prove that they don't doesn't seem to, to work. So probably we could. Now what Pyro is doing here is an argument by elimination. And there are two versions of this. One argument by elimination is kind of the Sherlock Holmes method. And the idea is, and it's one they often use in detective, you know, crime stories. So suppose you've got uh, five suspects and you know they're the only five. Like there's a murder on an island and there, you know, there's you and you know, five other people and the victim. And you know you, these are all the people. You know, it's not somebody that's hiding. So you know if you eliminate, you know, if you know if you've got five suspects, it's got to be one of them. You know if you eliminate four of them for sure, the one remaining has got to be the guilty person. You know, the Sherlock Holmes thing, whatever remains must be. Now there's also an argument by elimination that's more of an argument by extermination, where you say there's only say three or two exam two possibilities, and you show both fail, they don't work, so that means there's no possibility. So in this case, Pyro says there's only two ways you can know they both fail, so you can't know. Now the way to beat an argument by extermination is either of course to show that, you know, defend one of them so it doesn't get exterminated, or argue that it's being a false dilemma, that there's another way you could like know. So that's kind of the rules of battle. Now typically skeptics do go for an argument by extermination because you, you want to say, hey, there's no way you can, can know. So Pyro lays down sort of the two foundational ones. And these are still used today. If you hear skeptics arguing today, they will break out these arguments or some variation. Before moving on to our next exciting slide, anything about this that needs more? Not more, but the beginning you said skepticos uh, said something about sift. Oh yeah, the, the term skepticos means to sift. So we don't think it means like to doubt, because skepticism today is to doubt. So, so I found this one because uh, in the Bible, mm -hmm. Jesus, he, he tells Simon, the devil is coming to sift. Mm -hmm. And I, I understood it like for the bread, like how you make wheat and stuff, but now that you're explaining it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it might have been influenced by, by the, the Greek mm -hmm. notion, because the idea is to, to search for the, the truth, to you know to, to winnow out the the stuff you don't want, um, you know, to get to separate the grain from the, the ch wheat from the chaff, uh, some sort of sort of idea. Yeah, the, the Bible actually has uh, a lot of influence from uh, Greek and Roman philosophy. Uh, Paul explicitly mentions uh, the Stoics and the uh, Epicureans. So what do the skeptics end up accepting as their position? Well, given that reason fails, according to them, and senses fail, we can't know. So what do we do? Because we still maybe have 24 hours a day to fill up. Well, what they said is this. You can only talk about experience, the way things seem to be. So what they advocated, because again, you'd say to the skeptic, oh, that's a pretty, you know, okay, good arguments, but, you know, what do I do? Which is always a fair question. He says the thing to do is suspend judgment and not make any assumptions. So what about um, morality and stuff? Well, it had the following implications. Morality becomes also a subject of skepticism. So what should you do? Well, according to these Pernian skeptics, you should adopt apathy and indifference. Now today, apathy and indifference are typically presented in a very negative way that does not match the view of it during that, that time. And actually, even the technical view. Now today, if we say that someone is apathetic, is that insulting? Like if someone said, you're so apathetic, would you say, thank you, I've achieved the goal of the skeptics? No, if someone says you're apathetic or indifferent, this usually they're insulting you, saying about how you, you know, usually in some context of morality or society where they're, they're insulting you. Now, but the strict meaning of these terms are, are not negative or insulting. Apathy means 
basically a lack of pathos. Pathos is emotion. So being apathetic doesn't mean you're like, oh, I just don't care about anything. It means you're not ruled by emotions. You lack this pathos. And indifference is not like, we think of it today as like cruel indifference. Like someone is like, I don't care about those, those kids starving in you know, New Jersey. I don't care about that stuff. Uh, but indifference means you have no preference either way. So this would be sort of like... Uh, well, the apathy would be if you like Star Trek, kind of like the Vulcans, you know, you don't have the, you're not ruled by emotions. And the difference would be sort of like the, um, kind of like the archetype of the, the person who's sort of not swayed by the world. Like the, if you saw a Kung Fu Panda, you know, like the, the turtle way who's like meditating off and not caught up in all the emotions. Or like in many, like, you know, the old Kung Fu films, like the, the master who, dwells way out in the, the wilderness in like some ancient temple and they sit there and meditate, teach people how to how to do kung fu, but really don't get engaged in anything. So he's not saying they're not saying, you know, be disassociated a sociopath. What they're saying is you shouldn't be swayed by feelings and so on. You don't know what's real, so don't get caught up in it. Now of course you still have to exist in the society that maybe exists. So what do you do? Well, their answer is super mundane, which is this. Just go along with the laws and traditions. Now, so interestingly enough, there could be like a Peronian skeptic in the room with us right now. Be right behind you. But their behavior would be pretty much indistinguishable for anybody else's, for the most part. They mean, you might notice that they don't seem like super up, but most people in classrooms seem pretty, you know, you don't see a lot of like emotion, like outbursts typically. Everyone seems pretty like, <laughs> you know, feeling that apathy. And they would just behave normal. They wouldn't do anything like weird or unusual. They would just look like anybody else. So you could literally be walking past hundreds of protein skeptics every day and not realize it because they would just act like everybody else. Now, as you might imagine, from a moral standpoint, if you do believe in morality, this would be a problem because existing laws and traditions you might regard as like really terrible. So the Peronians would just be like, just go along, you know? So if the if the laws are whatever the laws are, just follow them. And the obvious problem is that if you again if you believe in ethics and you believe there can be evil laws and traditions, this is just saying go along with what whatever, which would be morally problematic. Now, as I mentioned, skepticism kept, you know, cycling, oddly enough. The next form of skepticism was called academic skepticism, which arose in Plato's academy, ironically enough. Because after Plato died, this fellow Arcesimus, and we have no idea how this is pronounced because, you know, we don't know the recordings. Uh, Greek scholars can probably make a guess. He was born in 316, died in 242, and he took over the academy. Now again, I say ironically because Socrates' deal, Plato's deal was to be the skeptic, to say we have knowledge. And so how did the academy get turned towards skepticism? Well, it'd be kind of like if you had a political party devoted to like equality, and then suddenly they turned to being like super racist and super sexist. You'd be like, what are you, what are you doing? And so when the academy went skeptical, people were like, what are you doing? Now their justification was this, I'll we'll close on this. Socrates, of course, said that he knows he knows nothing, despite the fact that he talks a whole lot of nothing. And many of the Platonic dialogues end not in certainty, but in uncertainty. Like they don't say, okay, now we know for sure what this is. And so these academic skeptics says, hey, we're just, we're just doing Socrates and Plato. Now, of course, that, that occurs whenever you have an institution that seems to like turn its back on its origins. They always say, hey, we're just doing what we've always done. And it's fair to always ask, are you, are you really doing what you've always done? In the case of the academy, it's probably not. So next time we'll go to looking at our good different communities and some more stuff. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on the first day. Mm -hmm.